testing. It was very testing. <laughs> Sorry for being late. Um, they shut the motorway on us. But anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's uh, wonderful that you've all um, been able to hang around. Um, and we're, going to, we're here to, what are we here to talk about, Art? Art. Uh, well, you talk about art, and I talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, well, here we are. Your and, exhibition. And, and, yeah. And I'm glad that we're in front of these pictures. Because these are among my favourite pictures of the last, I think, of the last ten years, if not ever. Yeah, they're quite high on my list, but it has to be a longer one than yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I, uh, one or two writers have suggested, you'd be in a position to answer the question, have suggested that perhaps the pictures have something to do with your memories of, of going to America very early in your life. Oh, they absolutely do. And um, home, home on the range was being belted out by the radio in the kitchen of the house that I spent lots of time in, and um, it's funny how these things come back, because when I was working away in my studio, I, I hadn't sung the song to myself for years, and suddenly it all came back, I mean, the, the, all the words, they're not very... Um, how, 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 old, how, how old were you when you went to America for the first time? Um, when did that happen? Anthony, how old was I? <laughs> yes, it must have been about seven. Yeah. yeah. But I seem to remember you once said to me that that was at that point. But it either confirmed you in the determination that you were yourself going to be a painter, or that, that trip gave you the determination. It's one or the other, I can't remember. Well, I mean, can't I say all of the above? All of the above is a good answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> but um, my mother had a great friend who was, was a neighbour where they lived in the country on Long Island. And he was called Philip Goodwin, and he was one of the designers of MoMA. Of MoMA? Yeah. And he looked at a picture I painted, which was shown to him with great pride, and he said, oh, it's this dreary little pastiche of Picasso, it's of no interest, whatever. That's encouraging. It was. It was very <laughs> encouraging. And several times in my life I've been encouraged by similar things. Um, but <clears throat> the great thing about that was that he made me a member of MoMA. There was I this little child. And you went? Yep. How often did you go? Twice a week, something like that. And what were you looking at? Um, many of the things I looked at were absolute rubbish. There was a painter that was very popular then called Peter Bloom, uh, who was a, a sort of sub-realist painter, mm. and really not very good, but was much admired by the people at MoMA at the time. I looked at all the great French pictures they had, which of course I couldn't see in England. What, oh, because? There weren't any. Right, I was completely going to say because of the war, no. No, but there just weren't any. I mean, there was a Frank Stoop who bequeathed his pictures to take, had um, a good painting by Matisse, which is wonderful in fact called Herb of Quay that I tongue to people. But to 
be the, the school age child. I mean, that was not something available. No. And the sort of pictures that were available to me were um, paintings by Paul Nash, yeah. Edward Barrow, and Sickard. So, um, I mean, the idiot's question is, you know, when anybody thinks about you, they think of one of the great colorists, one of the great users of color. I prefer that phrase, user of color, rather than colorist, because colorist sounds... Yeah, like thank you. Uh, yes, I, I feel rather insulted by colorists. Colorist. Yes, no, I, it's not. I, I do try to avoid it, actually, but it's user of color. I mean, where... Um, did that come from your, do you think that came from your encounter in America with French painting? Your sense of, you know, your, your sense of what colour could do? But there's so much English painting of the first half of the 20th century. You know, whatever one thinks of its qualities, it's essentially quite timid in its use of colour. Yes, and... Um, it was strained as well. And not mostly very good. I mean, I think that... Um, Scottish colourist is a myth, really. I mean, if I was a Scotsman, I'd be rather upset. You mean at the idea that there, there was a great school of Scottish colourists? Yes. Or, yeah. mm. I make no comment. Well, I hope later you will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... And colour is, and we've been through that, but is a pejorative term. No, I'm just, I'm, to me. I'm just wondering about, say, for example, the Red Studio. I mean, the Red Studio had just been bought by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So you saw that when for you were 320 when you, pounds. 320 pounds for the Red Studio. Going, going, gone. Good <laughs> Lord. That's and and did, so you, you saw that when you were... In America I saw it. I didn't see it in England. No. It was in the Gargoyle Club at the time. And... Uh, hmm. It was sold by whoever owned the Gargoyle Club. And... I can't see that because I can't remember the name of the person. No. What I suppose I'm slightly sideways edging towards is an interpretation of these pictures, which is up to me to do, not, not for you to confirm, but that these pictures yeah. might in some sense be about um, the memory of that awakening of yourself. Mm, they, they probably are, but... Um... And there's something very exultant, I feel, about them. Yes. And about the scale of them as well. I think the, most, the more successful ones are the barest. Um, I think I'd like to stop there. Absolutely stop there. Stop there. But, um, and I was very pleased when one of them was sold the other day. Sold to England? Sold to No, to uh, America, of course. <laughs> Where here would you find someone who'd buy one of these pictures? You, you never know. You, you never know. I, <laughs> I do know, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you say, you know, that you're, for you, the most successful or the barest in some senses. There's a lot more bareness. You, you, it seems to me that you use. Uh, you use the bare ground, or you allow it to remain bare more, if I were to generalise about your technique, or your, your, your habits, if you like, maybe not habits, maybe that's not the right word either, but you seem bolder in your use of the ground. And the, your I'm sure you're right about that, and it's, but it's taken me a pathetically long time to reach that point. Well, I don't know, but you once said to me that the trouble about being a modern... I, I think you... In fact, you quoted Picasso to me, and then I put that in the epilogue to my book about you. Because Picasso says... Picasso said, this, 
remarkable thing, I think, about the nature of what it is to be a painter in the modern period. He said that, you know, if you're a painter in the Renaissance period, you are asked to paint a Madonna. It's a given subject. It's a given commission. It's an altarpiece. Your individuality, your personality as an artist, your who you are, just emerges. And this is what Picasso said. And he said, but, but from Van Gogh onwards, an artist has to make himself up. He has to make up his style, he has to choose his subject matter, he has to find it all inside. It's as if a writer had to invent the language that he was going to write with. And it seems to me that you're a very good example of an artist who has worked just so hard and so stubbornly and persistently at that invention of a language for yourself. And it seems to me also that you're now um, reaping the rewards of that. And that you've got this freedom and this confidence that this, you know, that this is a language. It's a complete yeah, language. No, I wish that was true. I'm sure. I'm outside. I'm not in the studio. No, no, no. But, um... <laughs> it seems probably much easier to me than it could ever actually be. No, I think that um, it can be very easy once you have a language of your own. On the other hand, it can easily be a sort of um, cadeau or poisonné because you think that you've got it and you haven't. And you've painted yourself into a corner, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I, can, I don't like pejoratively mentioning the names of other painters, so I won't. But I, great friends of mine did just that. Hmm. Well, not being an artist myself, I mean, I, I just <clears throat> can't imagine the difficulties of it, especially being a modern artist. But it seems to me that there's, perhaps there's not luck involved, but there's a certain element of being the right person in the right place at the right time. Oh, undoubtedly there is. And I continually missed out on that. <laughs> but that was good for you. No doubt. It was a strengthening <laughs> process. No doubt. Yeah, but you didn't join. I, I think, I think um, again, for, for me, what, what I think is very important to the strength and development of the work is your insistence that each picture actually be about something. Yes. We're, we're, not, we're not talking untitled 17. No, we're not. We're, we're talking that the pictures have to be about something, so they're rooted in reality. So every painting is the application of your language to the memory of a real situation. Would I be right in saying that? Absolutely correct. So don't you feel that that keeps you, in a sense, honest? Is that your way of keeping yourself honest? I hope I've never had any problems keeping myself honest, but um, I probably have. No, what I mean is, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that if, if, the, if, if the... Once you've invented your language and it's made you Howard Hodgkin, that's your brand, that's you, there might be a temptation to repeat and reduplicate and do it once more without feeling. But your, what I was trying to imply was that your decision to always make every picture be about something is your way of trying to keep yourself as far away from that as you can. Yes, that, that is quite true. But um, somehow I think we're leaving something out here and I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, One of them, I was very fortunate in the people who taught me about art, one of whom was Anthony Blunt's brother, Wilfred, who was an amazing teacher. This is after America. This is after America, yeah. Thank you. Um, but. The real teacher I, <laughs> I had was the Penguin Modern Painters series. 
As in Caravaggio by Michael Levy, you mean that, that particular series? No, I don't mean uh, Michael oh, Levy. Oh, Penguin Modern Painters? Yes. Sorry, no, I don't know. Yeah. Which had brief and often very well written thin paperbacks with big colour reproductions of such artists as Matthew Smith, Paul Nash, and so on, I and mean, you can fill in the rest. Mm. And I used to look at them all the time. And one of the many schools I attended was Eton, where you could hang up pictures on your wall. You were allowed to, and I would, um, and it was a, a brilliant teacher, Wilfred Blunt, who insisted that he tore the pictures out of the book and you put them in a frame with glass and hung them on your wall. It was wonderful for me because I realized at once that pictures were things. And it took a very long time for me to come, become aware later in life that they were things. Mm. Because to most people they were not. They, what do you mean, they were images? They were images, yeah. exactly. They were illustrations of one sort or another. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, I think that's one of the, um, I suppose, absolutely most distinguishing characteristics of your pictures is that they're things, they're objects. They are objects. I mean, sometimes yeah. rather bruised and battered objects. I mean, you've painted <laughs> on all kinds of things, haven't you? You've painted yeah. on the seats of old stools. There are all, there are all sorts of pictures. There's a, very, there's a rather wonderful picture in that room where I happen to notice on the back the frame that you've used as part of your picture once contained a VR. I think it says VR 22 or something. Yes. <laughs> it's an amazing uh, gift from my youngest son, Sam, who had bought a VR, amazingly enough, and because he'd sold his flat, and he spent the money on buying a VR. <laughs> and That's your bad influence. <laughs> Dad, I've sold my flat and I bought a wheel. And, and how come you ended up <laughs> He gave me the frame. And it came from a famous American private collection and uh, hence it had we are written on the on the frame. And I felt very uh, proud of Sam having bought this painting, which typically he did a great deal of research about, and he found the place where Vuillard had made a little drawing, and so on, so on. But I always really knew that pictures were things. And among my <coughs> other great teachers was a man called <coughs> Charles Handy Reed and Charles wrote the first English book about Wyndham Lewis as a painter and I knew of him as a writer but not as a painter hmm. and Charles was an amazing man he <coughs> He lived in a house with his uh, aged female relations called Twitterside, which was known as Twitters. <laughs> and um, he was very proud that he and Wyndham Lewis were sort of like this. But Wyndham Lewis, when he went to see him, said, oh, people are always trying to get around me. Always. And he had a cigarette. And he just <laughs> said, oh, 
these ashtrays are impossible. <laughs> and so he kept putting the cigarettes out on the back of Charles's hand, who made no protest. Very bizarre. Very, yeah. But there was something about Wilfred that made one um, <laughs> respect him very much. And he lived in a house called Baldwin's Shore, which was a famous um, house because of William Corey, hmm. who wrote. And um, various the wonderful garden around him. And Wilfred introduced me to a new kind of interior decoration, which meant um, up yours to the people who came to see him. So he had hanging from the ceiling an enormous Negro sculpture of a dog that was very well uh, hung. And um, obviously excited by something or other, as Wilfred pointed out, and it hung in the middle of the room. And he said, for very awkward parents, he'd invite them in to see his art collection. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very easy not to take everything too seriously. But the, in terms of the thingness of, of works of art, and that works of art mm. are, um, you know, they're objects that, that, that either have the capacity to endure or not to endure. You once said, I think, to me that that, that was one of the reasons why you collected, because you're an artist who's always collected works of art. Yes. Indian works of art in particular, but many other types of art also. Um, you know, Am I right in thinking that you don't collect works of art, as it were, as sources of inspiration, as some artists have done? Never. No, they're not like that, are they? No. No way. Not at all. But is there some, is there some element of them collect, the activity of collecting being related to the activity of an artist in a way that doesn't involve that phrase, you know, their sources of inspiration? Could it be some other reason? Oh, yes. For it? Greed. <laughs> and um, the desire to possess. Um, a bargain. A bargain. No. Um, bargains have never appealed to me. And when people bring things for me to look at and say, it costs absolutely nothing, I say, what a pity. But didn't you once, didn't you once sell what, some huge percentage of, of your Indian art collection in order to buy a single piece of calligraphy? Uh, well, uh, roughly speaking, yes. What I did was to um, sell a lot of pages from um, a book of Arabic um, I can't 
think of the right word. It was a book of um, Arabic plants. Right. That were medicinal, and it was 15th century. And I bought it and then resold it and was able with the money to buy something which I thought was wonderful. Whereas this seemed to me simply a source of revenue. Yeah, but there's something quite obsessive about that activity of the collector. I mean, yes, I think there is. And one of my best friends in Oxford was Simon Digby, who <coughs> was a passionate collector. And also, in the end, a dealer, which most collectors become. You know, a marchand amateur, which is a very yeah. polite way of putting it. But well, Charles Saatchi became a dealer, didn't he? But I suppose that's not quite the not same. quite in the same way. But not as a marchand amateur. I mean, you just marchand amateur is more like a, de a collector dealer who, who, who deals in order to fund his passion for yes, collecting. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think that Charles has ever had any problem about funding his passion. Who knows? Hmm. But what about, uh, just to talk about the pictures in the current show, and talk about, talk about the subjects that you, that you paint. And one of the things, again, that I, I just, as it were, empirically seem to notice, is that, whereas in the past a lot of your titles seemed to hint at <coughs> particular moments of engagement with an individual, it seems to me that a lot of the pictures in this show Hint, uh, well, they seem that actually there's a lot of nature in, in no, that, that's quite true. There's a lot of landscape, there's a lot. Yeah. Of... I think I felt rather more confident than I used to be about the subject matter of my pictures. Can you explain? I can try. Um, I felt that it was unnecessary to have a passionate backstory. Horrible expression hmm. of the pictures that I painted. So I didn't anymore. I also, at the same time, decided that it was better not. keep painting and repainting my pictures until they were just so. I should do all the painting and repainting in my head, which is what I've done. How long, I mean, could you, could you, could you say, well, how, how long has that been the case for you? Are we talking 10 years, five years? Mm, all of the above. Um, because the gestational period of your paintings, I mean, I remember when I was writing my book that some of the pictures, I, I can't quote uh, chapter and verse, but there would be pictures that were dated 1972 to 1982. Yes, that still would be the case. That still might be the case. Yeah. But 72 now would be, there wouldn't be lots of painting going on. There might be, mu there might be more thinking. No, there are lots of thinking. Yeah. And I had to tell people who came and worked with me, like my remarkable assistant, Andy Barker, that if I sat for hours reading Agatha Christie and looking at the wall, it didn't mean I wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> and with a picture like, I mean, I, I, do you think appearances can be deceptive? I mean, I, I'm, it seems to me that a picture such as blood might have been long gestated in the mind, but actually when it was, when it was painted, the work looks as though it was done. Oh. <laughs> No, um, that's a tease, but um, yes, it was painted swiftly, but it was painted swiftly because I'd already done all the work in my head. 
But you don't dream, Francis Bacon used to say that he dreamed of pictures. You don't dream of pictures. You, this is a conscious process. Uh, more than not, yes. I think it is. But um, if I dreamed of pictures, I'd be very suspicious of them, of the dream. Well, no, I cannot see that because you're not, you're not an automatist or no, you're not interested no. in any of that. Not at all. Well, I sometimes think that you're filing pictures away. Well, like I am at this moment. I, well, I was... <laughs> I was if, I, if I ever saw a picture called High Wickham in the Rain... <laughs> <laughs> or Motorway. <laughs> no, um... No, but I, 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 are you consciously, as it were, angling? Or do you just let the process happen? I mean... No, I let the process happen. You can't um, angle for something like that. But for, I mean, for example, say somebody such as Gauguin consciously travelled in order to expose himself mm. to, to experiences that he hoped might result in paintings. Um, do, you, do you not do that? Or could you, could you work as... Have you got, an, as it were, enough of a store of memories to be going on with for you not to feel that, that, you, know, you, that, that you would do that? I have a, an enormous store of memories, far more than I'll ever be able to use in real life. And <clears throat> I'm very lucky that as I grow older, which seems to be an increasingly... Um, what's the right word? Importunate situation. I mean, the, the older I get, the, the more um, the more pressure I feel from the passage of time. But the pressure is not that I don't have anything to say or to talk about or think about, but there's just so much. And you've become more prolific. I mean, in the sense that you're, I made a statistical analysis, but it seems to me just from the experience of coming to your studio, yeah. that, that you're in a very, well, the last couple of years in particular, you've been in a very fruitful vein. Yes. Almost, almost an inverse proportion to your um, how Past. it fell out of bed recently and smacked his head. You said that your cardiologist, was it your cardiologist in France, whoever it was, that there's always a new adventure. So it's always an inverse <laughs> yes, proportion true. to your physical frailty. <coughs> you, seem to be, you seem to be producing more and more work. And I'm not physically frailer. I apologise <laughs> in front of everybody for... for <coughs> no, but I'm not, um, surprisingly. Well, I, I, I think I wrote, not about this show, but about the last, I think it was about the last show of, of recent work that I saw, which probably was about four years ago, I don't know, but that I had a very strong sense that almost that I can hear these paintings being made. I can hear thumping. <laughs> I mean, if you look at some of these pictures, you can, they've actually got a kind of an auditory sense to them that, that, that I can hear that. Well, you would know that better than I, because I, <coughs> I can only feel what I feel when I'm doing that. And is it important to you to get yourself into, I mean, there's this sort of uh, exercise that Zen painters and, and, well, certainly orthodox painters of the painters of altarpieces and other religious paintings in the Greek Orthodox tradition, or the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's always this very strong idea that actually part of your preparation in that tradition was to, was to pray and to, and to actually get yourself into the appropriate frame of mind. No, the state of grace. Or state whatever. of grace. And it's literally that's part of the Orthodox painter's training is to do this. Is there any sort of, as it were, secular version of that in your life? Absolutely. 
So when do you paint? Do you paint in the morning? Do you paint in the afternoon? Do you paint all the Paint all the time. As my great old friend Patrick Caulfield said, artists never stop working. It's true. In my case. But is there a particular, I mean, as it were, is it, the working might take the form of reading the Agatha Christie novel and staring at the wall, and Andy wonders if you're actually working and you're working. But in, when it comes to actually putting the paint on the support, is that, um, as it were, is that a critical moment in the process? Is that a moment for which you have to feel right and now's the moment? Or is it less, as it were, precious than that? Do you decide that you're <coughs> going to do something and then you find out if it's the right or not moment when you start doing it? It's more that than anything else. Yeah. But, um, well, two things in reply to that. I think it's very difficult for painters to be as exposed as they are now. And I'll talk about that more later. But your privacy is gradually taken away from you by this great um, well of information that grows up. Do you, mean, do you mean biographical information that people publish and elicit from you in interviews and...? That sort of thing. But more than that, it's a feeling that the necessity of a certain kind of privacy is essential. You mean not, not to have people come up to you in the street? You mean that sort of yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind it. I'm flattered when they do that. But it interrupts a train of thought or a web of feeling hmm. which can be, in a sense, quite costly. I remember I interviewed Pierre Dex, very who must be in his late 80s, early 90s, very energetic, friend of Picasso in the 1940s. And he said, he said oh, I used, to, I, used to go out for, I used to go out for a meal with Picasso. Often we'd go out to Brasserie, this was after the war. Picasso's a celebrity, as far as I thought. And he said, oh, no, no, c'est c'était avant le jour de Hello magazine. And he, he wasn't famous at all, he was just this little short guy. And I'd go, out, I'd go out and have dinner with him, and nobody knew who he was. And he was, he was just so happy not to be known, and yeah. just to live in Paris. And we used to go home and always have to be in, in Picasso's flat by nine o'clock, because that's when the wrestling began. <laughs> <laughs> and Pierre Dex says, this is very apropos of you and your Agatha Christie novel, Pierre Dex said, I said to Picasso, well, why is a great artist watching wrestling? What's that all about? Le Catch, as he called it. It's like French versions of Big McManus, and Picasso said, Je travaille. I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at those Picasso pictures of the, of the 50s, yes, suddenly I go, Yes, of course, they're wrestling. <laughs> but what did you mean? I want you to explain. What, what did you mean when you say exposed? Is, was that what you meant? It was exactly what I meant. I thought you might mean that there are so few of you left. Painters, there seems to be so little painting these days. Well, I, <clears throat> there does seem to be very little left, but that's not my fault. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you scared them all off. <laughs> if only. But what do you feel about that? I mean, the, 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 as it were, I mean, I remember when I started being an art critic in about 85, there were too many. Most of what I looked at was painting. Now it's, it's really, it's rare. Oh, it's a painting. Look. It's <coughs> an in, in, endangered species. Yeah. <coughs> I don't mind at all being one of an endangered species. I used to, but I don't anymore. Well, I suppose what I wanted as a, a, a curator, I won't name at the Tate, once said to Nick Sorota's slight consternation, he said, 
Well, the trouble is, Nick, see, that I don't actually, you know, I'm a curator of painting. I actually don't think that most of what is in Tate Modern belongs to the same category of object as the things that I look after. I don't see a connection. In fact, I see a closer connection between what I see at the cinema and what I look after at the Tate than I do between Rebecca Horn's new installation mm. and what I look mm. after at the Tate. And I was curious to know whether, uh, you know, as, uh, as an artist, I mean, do you feel that you are engaged in fundamentally the same activity as someone who's, I don't know, working at, you're doing the kind of grand spectacle that tends to fill the turbine hall, or do you feel that you're actually, you're actually doing something else? No, I, the first is true. So you are engaged in the same, yeah. so you are um, part, part of the same tradition. Yeah, absolutely. I often regret and feel hurt that this isn't a view shared by people who are not apparently doing what I do. You mean that they don't feel that you're part of what they do? Mm, exactly. Hmm. And what makes, what, what makes the connection? I mean, is it, is it just the mere fact, the existence of a, of a world called the art world, of a world called the contemporary art world, of, of contemporary art museums? Well, I just don't know anything about all that. No, okay. <laughs> I won't go there, then. <laughs> no, please don't, because no. I'll be in a false position at once. Yes. But to go back to what we were saying, before, we were talking before about um, my sense that there's a lot more, as it were, weather uh, uh, in the paintings nowadays, that you're, you paint pictures called shadow, lawn, um, mud, mm. dirty weather, rather than, I don't know, in the garden with blah, 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 such and such and such a person. I mean, I feel like, I feel as though, say, autumn leaves, it's a picture that isn't in this show, is it? No. But that picture, again, I felt, I just felt, yes, autumn leaves. Mm. I didn't, it's a slightly different feeling from feeling, oh, I wonder who Terence McKinnon was, mm. and I wonder what that garden was like, and I wonder what went on there. Quite often now, I mean, perhaps it's an illusion, but I, I just look at one of your pictures and I go, yes. Good. Miami is exactly like that. <laughs> good, good, yeah. I'm delighted. And was that, is that, in what sense is that a, Am I responding to a change in your own approach? You no, I don't think you are at all. I think that my own approach has never changed since I was a child. In a way, that's probably my only strength as a painter. It's amazing. I mean, the very first picture I had painted, I think, or, the, or the, that you kept, mm. that you painted, is, is that picture, Memories. Yes, indeed. Which is, I, I would say, I think it should hang at the beginning of every Howard Hodgkin exhibition as a sort of, because it's, it's still such a strong picture and it's still, weirdly enough, although it's representational in a, uh, you know, perhaps in a, in a more traditional sense, um, but it's so inimitably a Howard Hodgkin. Mm. I knew it was when I finished it. And you were how old? Fifteen? You were very young. I, mean, I was fifteen, 15. yes. Yeah. And I remember being very upset when the then um, film critic of the um, Evening Standard, God knows what he was called, um, and who's an old friend of Alan Christie's and the collector of prints, mm -hmm. said I'd peaked early. <laughs> I thought that was rather mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I can't remember what the format is. Are we going to open this to a question or two? Yeah? Why don't we do that? Are you happy if we do that? If we uh, ask the audience, uh, as it were, to quote, who wants to be a millionaire? Any questions? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Oh, that's easy. Nobody in their right mind would paint for a critic. I drive, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, climbing. No critic in their right mind would want to be a critic rather than a viewer. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. 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 Desperately. I always look and see what people have written about my work, if with luck they have. And does it yeah. hurt? Does it hurt? Yes, immensely. Even if they're prats? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Oh, there's another question coming from stage left. Um, Mr. Hodgkin, I come along with the obsession of one of the pictures in this show, which is called Leaf. Oh, join the crowd. It is to be one stroke of the brush. And I just would be grateful if you had anything to say about the process. Oh, I think it was two strokes, but I can't now remember. It's a, a two-stroke engine. Was it you who asked that question? No. It's a gentleman. Ah. Secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just got a question. You, you said you do a lot of your uh, preparation with Agatha Christie and staring at walls. Do you do any preparatory sketches or do you have. No, I don't. I you used ever to, with? but I don't. So you work directly from your thoughts mm. straight on to the... The support, whatever support, it is, yeah. yes. There was that Suraz Bathers picture, which is a slightly unusual... Well, it was a commission. That was a commission. And... Um, it but it had an underdrawing of sorts. Or it not, did, not, no, not it ex. did, indeed it did. And the, the underdrawing was by... A, a, Someone who's written very well about my painting, John Paul Stonard, who works for Burlington. Right. And he did the underdrawing for that. But um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, okay. I think it's to get here. <laughs> Well, I think it's a, that my short answer would be no, but I think it is an ambition of nearly all uh, contemporary artists to feel that they can affect governments and journalists and people who affect public opinion, but I don't think they ever do. And um, 
I'd be delighted if I felt that I did, but I, I'm quite sure that I don't. And I'm equally quite sure that artists I know and admire very much um, like to feel that they do, and I'm equally sure that they don't. That's not quite the same as being political, whether you affect it or not. To me, it would be. Hmm. I agree with you, it isn't quite the same, but I would love to think that um, in the self, the before self-indulgent way of a, um, a living artist now, I could by what I did affect what happens. I simply don't believe I ever could. And I don't believe that anyone can. And looking at the <coughs> AIA, you know, the Artists International Association, which is a, a small sort of pressure group I don't think any of them, them ever affected the outcome of the Spanish Civil War, for example. No, maybe not in that direct sense, but I don't know. I think you can never underestimate the effect. You know, a particular work of art could have a particular effect on a particular person who could then go on to be hugely politically influential human being. It's that sort of butterfly effect. It could, yeah, well, the guy, it, it could always happen. I admire you for saying that. Well, I, I, I wish I believed it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, my personal opinion of your work is that it because it expresses um, such a full sense of who you are that how could it not express your politics as well as your morality? It probably does, but not in a way that I could define. No, I wouldn't have said it's... No, no, not, 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 as it were, you know, make a list. But I sort of, I felt very sorry that there's a painting that you painted called Intimations of War, which is a wonderful painting in your Tate show. It's it in hung, Belgium now. It, did, it hung in the last room? Yes, it did, room. it did. And at the time of that show, it was hard not to feel that there was something going on there that began with a P. Good, I'm delighted. I really am delighted, but uh, I would feel that it, to make any such claim on my part would be um, no, I understand. too much. I understand. What are you working on now? I'm working on more paintings. <laughs> the most recent one, perhaps, that you would have seen is Blood. I, I absolutely, I'm over here. <laughs> I absolutely love your paintings, some more than others, but I'm really drawn to them. And I'm particularly drawn to colour but I think you have a very complex relationship with the way you use colour. And many people are drawn to your colour, but I'm wondering about what your response would be to that, if you could say. Oh, I could say that many of the artists whose work I admire most have been famous for their use of colour, but I think that colour is strictly functional. In my own case. And I don't mean less of how I use it, but it always has a function in terms of the picture. Sorry. Um, you use a lot of phrase in your 
Yes. Yeah, that's true. That's quite true. Um, it varies immensely. The trouble is that I have no ability to read a list of measurements and translate them into... Golden section? Oh, well, yes, I know about the golden section. But <laughs> I don't... That doesn't enable me to make... Um, Mm. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> You've got that one sorted. It <laughs> <laughs> was the obvious question, Andrew. I know. <laughs> um, can I can I thank you all for like most things tonight. It's been a little um, free form. And uh, I was intending to do a, a very lengthy introduction, but um, thankfully I didn't, maybe. Um, but we thought you'd done that already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, thank you all for, for, for coming, and um, especially to um, Andrew and Andy and Anthony, and um, for, for, for braving um, the weather and the car crashes and the, the M40, which I'm sure um, will always um, stay in your memory now, Andrew. Um, but a, a huge, huge thank you to, to Howard, um, not, not just for this evening and the, the generosity with which he's spoken uh, about his, his work, his influences, his history, his, his, his memories, um, but really for contributing to um, the whole history of, of modern art Oxford, yet another uh, sensational exhibition which I know for um, generations on people will remember and talk very fondly about. So um, a huge thank you to you both, and um, the bar is still open for another hour. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.